Hello, everybody, and thank you for tuning in to the Liberty Report. Today is a special day because we have a special guest, and he happens to be related to me, Senator Rand Paul. Rand, good to see you. Glad to be here. Well, good, and you've only arrived here into the Bay, great town of Lake Jackson, returning to your original home. That's right. And uh, you just arrived a few minutes ago, but I'm glad you made it into the studio because we don't get to interview our uh, our guests too often in the studio. Usually it, it's remote, but uh, this is just great that you uh, were able to make it here. You know, I often think about, uh, you know, the statement, you sort of can uh, cling to this statement, but not totally. People would ask us, uh, People who came from the north, they say, uh, you know, uh, well, you're you're from the north, and they say, yeah, but the answer was yes, but I got here as soon as possible. And I think about you, you can almost say that because uh, uh, when I was drafted, I was in Michigan, and on our way to Texas, which we, we were in Pittsburgh, our old home, my old home, that's where you were born. So you were about a week or two old when we had to drive to Texas. So you could say, I got to Texas as soon as I could. <laughs> but uh, you decided to settle down uh, in, in Kentucky because it was destined that you would become a senator there. <laughs> but, I don't know if it was destined or not, but, uh, <laughs> but most of my childhood, other than probably two years that we were in Pittsburgh during your residency, I spent in Texas, went to school here, and then when I finished uh, my medical training, uh, you know, I married a girl from Kentucky, and that's how and, I got there. And she had an influence on you uh, a little bit. That's right. Yeah. That's Kelly, and uh, and that's uh, wonderful. But uh, today we're going to talk about some very serious stuff. But uh, we always conclude, and I know you're one that concludes with optimism, and. Uh, to me, pointing out the problems uh, is very important, but I was always pleased at the end of talking to a lot of college students that if you had, if you described the problem and you came up with an answer, recognizing the problem and saying there is an answer gave optimism. So that's what uh, you've been able to do because uh, you've sort of clung to this uh, philosophy that uh, maybe we should follow the Constitution and uh, maybe we should have more individual liberty. So we want to talk about that. And you, you've you been very much involved in um, some of the current events. And, and the one that uh, caught my attention just recently uh, had to do with Saudi Arabia arms sales. We did a program on this and it was well received, but we can get a personal update on this because obviously uh, it, it uh, got your attention as well. And not because we talked about it, but it just naturally you, it got your attention, but you're in a place where you could do something about it and you've introduced the resolution. I'd like you to uh, tell our viewers exactly what you did how, and how it would work and what are the odds of us stopping that sale? Well, we discovered about a year ago, my staff did in researching the legislation from the 1970s. In 1976, there was an Arms Export Control Act and it gave Congress the right to tell the president, we disagree, we disapprove, and actually to try to stop an arms sale. Interestingly, buried in the bill was the ability of one senator to request a vote and to get a vote. And so this really boxes them up. The leadership hates it because they want to do what they want to do. They don't want to do what the rank and file wants. So we've done this twice now. We tried to block F-16 sale, subsidized sale to Pakistan. We lost. But interestingly, we, I think we won the public debate because the sale still hasn't gone through. Wow. <laughs> and then last fall, we objected to the sale of smart bombs, smart music, munitions to Saudi Arabia. Once again, we lost overwhelmingly, like 75 to 25. But I think President Obama listened to what we were saying because Yemen's a humanitarian disaster. The bombs that Saudi Arabia has been dropping on Yemen are indiscriminately killing civilians. They bombed a funeral procession. They killed 150 people in a funeral procession and wounded 500. There are 18 million people that are living at a starvation level in, so in Yemen. And the question I have is, do you think more arms are going to make the starvation better or worse? And there are people now gearing up. They want to invade and, and occupy and open another port. And there's already a blockade of food. So it's a real disaster. And we kind of are winning the public relations debate. And it kind of goes back to what I think you often said, is that the legislature is disconnected from the people often. The people are often maybe a decade in advance of the people in Washington. But I think if we could get enough people to hear about the war in Yemen and our participation in it, 
they might say, what is really our beef with the people of Yemen? What, what is our goal in being involved in that war? How many other senators have used this recently or over the years that it was available, or has it been sort of lying there dormant and nobody really paying attention to I think to it was it? lying there dormant that people had forgotten about. I think one person has used it other than myself, and it was 20-something years ago. But we plan on using it frequently and, until they're going to get tired of me using it because um, there really is no role for us in the war in Yemen. And I actually fear that what happened in Syria, where we supported one side, Assad was in the other, and then ISIS was here, that in the chaos, in that vacuum, ISIS grew, maybe as partly because of our involvement. And then the same thing in Yemen. There's really three sides to that war, at least. There's the government that Saudi Arabia supports, there's the Houthi rebels that Iran supports, but then there's Al-Qaeda in the Arab Peninsula, I'm kind of worried that al-Qaeda actually grows and takes over Yemen after each of the other groups destroy themselves. There weren't that many opportunities in the House to do what you're able to do as a senator. The closest thing that ever came to the, uh, that principle was in 1998, they had an Iraqi Liberation Act, which was always obviously the opposite, because in my interpretation, right. it, was a, a, it was a declaration of war. And they brought it up under suspension. Nobody's going to oppose this. So but see, if both sides opposed it or, or were in favor of it, one person could get all the time in opposition. So it turned out that I ended up with 20 minutes and the rest of the Congress had 20 minutes. But I didn't stop the war, obviously. A few years later, the war came anyway. We've had a couple situations like that in the Senate, and it's still debatable. They say, oh, the Republicans and Democrats split the time equally. And I said, well, no, shouldn't it be for and against? Because sometimes I'm the only <laughs> yeah. one against. And they try to tell me I don't get any time that the Republicans and Democrats split it equally, even though they're both on the same side of the issue. And we've had some battles in the Senate over that. Sometimes they give me the time to be nice. Sometimes they try to exclude me. That same thing came up when we were doing a resolution in the House on uh, going to war uh, against Iraq, you know, and that, that debate on, went on for about a year. But, uh, and we had a small coalition of some Republicans and, and Democrats, but they didn't divide the time that way. That, that makes my argument that, uh, you know, th there's probably too much bipartisanship right. on the bad stuff. They get together and, and, and lo and behold, you know, they tend to, uh, you know, pass budgets and and spend a lot of money and run the welfare state into foreign policy very bipartisan even though they um, pretend they argue there's a couple things I've pointed out with Saudi Arabia and one the foolishness of getting involved in the war in Yemen that there are no good people right. in that war who are the good guys it's very unclear and maybe the result is you know that al-Qaeda rises up but the other thing I pointed out about Saudi Arabia is there are still many allegations that they were involved in 9-11. Senator Bob Graham was head of the 9-11 Commission. He's followed this and looked at all the details. He's convinced that the Saudi Arabian government and or <laughs> royal family had something to do with funding 9-11. But it's even worse than that, even more recently than that. You know in the emails from uh, Hillary Clinton to John Podesta that were released by WikiLeaks, she says in one of the emails to John Podesta, she says, we need to put pressure on Saudi Arabia and Qatar because they're giving financial and logistical support to ISIS and to radical Sunni groups in the Syrian civil war. She said that. She basically admitted Saudi Arabia is funding ISIS. And so how do we reward them for funding ISIS? We're going to now give them $100 billion worth of weapons. I think it's a, a crazy, rotten thing to do. It is. It's unbelievable. And I think the point, if the American people that you made, that if the American people knew uh, exactly what's going on, and that's been a big job of yours and all of ours, is try to get this information out to people. But you do serve on foreign relations, so you deal with a lot of this uh, information on foreign affairs. But there's another thing on foreign affairs that came up in your committee, and there was a vote, and that has to do with sanctions. And you know my position on sanctions. You know, I get pretty worried about sanctions. So what was, what was that vote about? And uh, don't we have to sanction these Iranians? Aren't these the people who are breaking the rules? Well, it's interesting because I think it ties into the whole Saudi Arabian thing. Iran, we have an agreement with them on a nuclear agreement. And really, even by all accounts, even the Trump administration is saying they are adhering to the nuclear agreement. However, they're still developing ballistic missiles. So I made the point the other day, and I actually brought an amendment. I didn't make a vote on it, but I brought an amendment to the Iran sanctions. And there were three different sections on the ballistic missiles. One was on ballistic missiles, one was because they're involved with terrorism, and the other is human rights uh, abuses by Iran. So I, I brought an amendment to say Iran and Saudi Arabia and have the sanctions <laughs> be against both. And uh, they weren't too happy with me. But then I pointed out Hillary Clinton's statement about terrorism and ISIS, 
human rights abuses. There's a young Shiite uh, man who's 17 when he was arrested. He's been in prison for five years on death row. His uncle was executed. He's on death row, and the way they kill him over there is they're beheaded and crucified. I'm not sure what the order is, but they're beheaded and crucified. But his crime was showing up at a protest. I think his uncle was speaking at the protest. His uncle was a religious Shia, Shia cleric, and they, of course, accuse him of terrorism, but I have no idea what the proof is on either side. But he was executed. The son is to be executed. And as far as other human rights abuses, there was a girl they called the girl of Khadif, raped by seven men. And in Saudi Arabia, the fault is in those who are the victim. And so she was told it was her fault for being alone with a man. And she was given 70 lashes and six months in prison. Mm. And yet we are giving weapons to people, and not just only weapons, we're refueling their planes providing them with the bombs, and they're bombing civilians in Yemen with it. Do you, do you ever wonder who the, who the power brokers are that are able to continue this type of policy regardless of who's uh, in the administration? Well, you're, it, you're right. It's definitely bipartisan. So on the committee, like on the sanctions vote, I voted against new sanctions on Iran, um, and I, I was one of three, two Democrats and myself. But overwhelmingly, at the top of the committee, the powers that be on both sides of the aisle, it's an identical foreign policy. They, they want more sanctions, and I think they would actually vote to, to, to invade Iran if they were given that vote. Yeah. yeah. Well, you've uh, done some work on civil liberties as well, and there's a renewal coming up for FISA, for the FISA courts, right. and uh, that's a very controversial subject, and uh, of course we should get rid of a lot of that, but it's coming up for renewal, and uh, where do you think uh, we are, where we stand, those of us who would like to see right. a lot of, a lot of the uh, authority eliminated or not well, renewed? Well, I, I won't vote for renewing it, so I won't renew its authorization, but I usually try to come up with some amendments to try to change it because I probably won't get enough votes. There'll be five or ten of us out of a hundred that will vote against renewing it. But we might have a chance to actually pass an amendment that I would actually restrict it. Now, Judge Napolitano and others have talked about FISA, and one of the main problems he says is that in a real court, a real court of justice, you have to have two sides. If you're accused of something, you have to have your own attorney, and it has to be public. You have to be confronted by your accusers. Courts in secret can't find justice, and courts in secret where only one side, the government, is represented, can never find justice. So there's an imperfection to the court that uh, will, will never be good about FISA, and it should be. And you can have a regular court, and I think uh, Judge Napolitano and others have said, you know what, if something's top secret, you still can have a jury, and you go into secret session with a public court while names are being mentioned that you don't want to be mentioned in public, but you can still have a public trial. But I'll oppose the authorization. But one of the amendments, there are two amendments I'm thinking about. They have all these databases, and this is through backdoor searches. So they can search uh, anybody who's talked to Assad, but it's worse than that. If you mention Assad in an email, now you've talked about Assad, your email's picked up. So. Think of reporters mentioning it all the time. So all of the reporters' emails are going to be looked at that mention Assad or Baghdadi or any of these names of figures over there. If you mention it in a report, your email is being sucked up. So millions of emails, millions of phone calls are sucked up. They won't tell us the exact number because it's classified. But that database, that's uh, one of the databases is the back door. But then there's another database called 12333, which is an executive order originally from Reagan, but really allows the president to do anything. And under that one, we think there's another database. We're not positive because they won't tell us, but there are these databases. So I'm going to introduce one amendment that says if they want to put an American's name into the search engine to query these secret databases, they should go to a regular court and have a regular judge give them a regular warrant with a fourth, all full Fourth Amendment protections. So that's one amendment. And actually, I think some of the people in the past that have not been very good on this, some people are starting to say, you know what, I can't believe they're searching politicians' names. Susan Rice may have been searching my name. We think she was. We don't have the proof yet, but we've asked them to look at that because there are rumors from different reporters they've been searching political names in there. So we want to get a regular warrant. And then the second thing that's always offended me is they drop the constitutional level to get information on foreigners. And there is some argument to be made for that if you live in Syria and you're on a battlefield, you don't get the same constitutional protections that an American is. But they're taking that and that conversation with the American, and then they could go to the American's house and do like a sneak and peek raid where they go in and nobody knows they ever came to your house. And 
it turns out they find out that you were bringing some paint home from your office and painting your house, which is a tax violation. You've used business expenses for home use, but they can actually use that, do a sneak and peek terrorist, you know, uh, permit and get in your house, but then convict you on a domestic crime. And it actually is happening under Section 113 of the uh, Patriot Act. 99% of the people convicted are for domestic drug crime, not for terrorism. So one of the amendments we'd like to do is to say that any information that comes from these foreign policy terrorist warrants could not be used in a domestic crime. Right. You know, um, we have so many things that we can go over, and we're not going to be able to go over all of these, but I do want to get into a couple other things to get an update because you've worked on these issues. And, one, and you've gotten some coverage on it, on your proposals on Obamacare. And, um, of course, we heard a lot when it was going through the House. And I think if I had to guess, the average person now says, well, that bomb didn't work, all kinds of mess. It's not going to happen. Right. What's the Senate going to do? And are they on the verge of uh, making a statement or having a vote or making progress? Or do you think this is going to be this way for the next six months where nothing really specific I, is done? I think something will pass. It'll be imperfect and it won't fix the problem. And two years from now, insurance rates will continue to go up and we'll still have the disaster that we have in health care. Probably nothing has disappointed me more, though, that Republicans have not followed through with what they said they believed in. We voted 60 times on a straight repeal. Just repeal as much. It wasn't a complete repeal, but it was 85% straight repeal. We did it 60 times when, we, when President Obama was in the White House and we couldn't get him to sign it. As soon as we got all three branches of government, now we're no longer for repeal. I added up the subsidies the other day, the government subsidies. In the next six years, Obamacare will have $624 billion in subsidies. The Ryan Plan, $574 billion in subsidies. Almost equal amount of subsidies. And it used to be that we didn't think the federal government should be subsidizing health insurance <laughs> oh, at all. We right. were against that. Now the Ryan Plan is actually basically Obamacare light. The other thing they do in it, which uh, worries me, is that it becomes a permanent entitlement program. A family of five can get $14,000 back from the government even if they paid no taxes. But that's really a, an entitlement by any other name. They just call it a tax credit. But yeah. if they're refunding money to you that you didn't pay, it's somebody else's money. And it's just, it's, a, it's an entitlement program. We can't afford the existing entitlement programs. How are we going to afford a new one? Yeah. Well, the, a couple other things in, in terms of money and how they're going to pay for all this foreign, foreign uh, activity, as well as in the medical industry, Medicare and Medicaid, they're, they're not really solvent, and, uh, and the money's not, where, uh, and not, not there. And I keep uh, arguing that we're in this mess because the country is really bankrupt. This bipartisanship, you, can, you just described it, you know, they ended up sort of poor, supporting the same thing. That th there's a limit to it because when they're divvying up the loot of a very wealthy nation, I just don't think we're as wealthy as we used to be and it depends on printing money and, and it's not working out so well. So now they, we're approaching this year a, what, a $4 trillion uh, budget and uh, we have a, uh, have a debt limit to increase, which are technical things because they'll argue and fuss and scare people. Well, we have to do it, we have to do it. Or just look at this yelling and screaming has been made by the, by the far left that if you cut one nickel out of it, right. you were throwing everybody into, into the streets. So uh, th this, this, I think, is uh, insurmountable. I don't see how they're going to have a solution. And, and right. I think we're working to a, a big problem where we'll be forced to do something, but they're afraid to admit this whole system doesn't work. We're bankrupt. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, and, and, and just it's, this year alone, like, this fiscal year alone, we're going to spend $500 billion more than comes in. Every one of the entitlement programs now spends more than it brings in. Social Security spends more than comes in. Medicare spends more than comes in. Medicaid spends more than, and Medicaid has no funding source. Medicare and Social Security do, but they, they spend more than comes in. And so that's my argument against keeping the Medicaid expansion or any of the Obamacare programs. You can say you're for them and you want to help people, but admit that there's no money. So you're right, the debt ceiling will come up. If we don't raise the debt ceiling, people say we will default. And I guess my response usually to people is, I'm stuck with two problems. I really don't think we should just shut down government all the time, but at the same time, which is worse, shutting down government or keeping it open and not reforming it? Keeping it open and borrowing a million dollars a minute, that's not very responsible. And so we have to do something, and I've always said, there could be a time I could vote to raise a debt ceiling. I have never voted to raise a debt ceiling, 
but I will vote to raise the debt ceiling if we significantly reform in an honest way. So I did vote for a proposal that would have, it didn't pass, but we would have put, we would have put real spending cuts, caps on spending, and an amendment to the Constitution saying we have to balance our budget from here on out. And then I would say, well, if we're going to do something responsible, we could raise the debt ceiling. You know, uh, th this idea of government shutdown, we don't want to shut it down, and people are frightened by that, and they usually never do it. It's all fake right. when, when they do it. But uh, the real shutdown is when uh, the system sort of collapses, you know, and they lose confidence in our bonds and our, uh, you, you know, on, on the dollar. So it e eventually closes. The market is very powerful. It, it'll shut it down, but uh, people who know what we should do in working the transition, and I can see, sense the frustration, that how do you do it? Do you get five votes out of it? But I still think it's important. I think it's crucial uh, what you do to bring attention to it. This whole thing uh, about Af you know, the, the uh, stopping the weapons to Saudi Arabia, and I want to encourage our viewers that if you care about this, call, you know, call Absolutely. their senators and, and agitate because, you know, when the people wake up and really yell and scream, uh, they were sick and tired of the last administration and they got wiped out in the election. Right. But then you expressed the frustration, yeah, they did, but we're not doing what we said we were going to right. do. You're seeing the anger at the town halls, mostly from the left, but the people who don't want another war in Yemen, who do not want us to be involved in another war, they need to be as loud as the left is. And part of the left needs to help us as well, but someone's got to call, someone's got to get going. Most of America does not know that we are actively involved in a war in Yemen and in danger of actually, we've already had one manned raid in there that didn't go well, and uh, we're in danger of getting sucked more and more into that war in Yemen, and we still have a war in Syria. We still, they're talking about an escalation or a surge in Afghanistan. There is absolutely no mission left for us in Afghanistan. 5,000 more people going in there. Well, we're gonna close the program now. Is there any last word you'd like to leave with our viewers or urge them to uh, uh, get active and help you out on some of these things? Just give them a little message. No, I think really where we're at a biggest deficit is in the foreign policy in Washington. There's just a very small group, but it is bipartisan. So Chris Murphy's a senator from uh, Connecticut. He'll co-sponsor the resolution on Saudi Arabia. And actually the last time when we got 20, 25 votes, most of them were Democrats. There is a possibility for a bipartisan coalition on this. And I think if you put it to a public vote, like we had a public plebiscite of all the United States, I think it'd be pretty close. In fact, I think we might win that vote. But we get killed in Washington because the people up there are very influenced by people who make money off of the arms sales. And one of the things I was proudest of was when Chris Murphy was asked about this, he says, well, you have arms manufacturers in Connecticut. <laughs> and he said, well, um, I will never make a decision on whether or not we sell arms, whether we go to war based on someone's profit on selling arms. There you go. Anyway, Rand, thank you very much. I'm glad you made it into town at the nick of time to be on this very special program. Thanks for having me. And I am sure the uh, uh, viewers are going to be very pleased with the interview. And I want to thank all our viewers for tuning in today to the Ron Paul Liberty Report. Please come back soon. a vote. And so this really boxes them up. The leadership hates it because they want to do what they want to do. They don't want to do what the rank and file wants. So we've done this twice now. We tried to block F-16 sale, subsidized sale to Pakistan. We lost. But interestingly, we, I think we won the public debate because the sale still hasn't gone through. Wow. <laughs> and then last fall, we objected to the sale of smart bombs, smart music, munitions to Saudi Arabia. Once again, we lost overwhelmingly, like 75 to 25. But I think President Obama listened to what we were saying mm. because Yemen's a humanitarian disaster. The bombs that Saudi Arabia has been dropping on Yemen are indiscriminately killing civilians. They bombed a funeral procession. They killed 150 people in a funeral procession and wounded 500. There are 18 million people that are living at a starvation level in, so in Yemen. And the question I have is, do you think more arms are gonna make the starvation better or worse? And there are people now gearing up, they want to invade and, and occupy and open another port. And there's already a blockade of food. So it's a real disaster. And we kind of are winning the public relations debate. And it kind of goes back to what I think you often said is that the legislature is disconnected from the people often. The people are often maybe a decade in advance of the people in Washington. But I think if we could get enough people to hear about the war in Yemen and our participation in it, 
they might say, what is really our beef with the people of Yemen? What, what is our goal in being involved in that war? How many other senators have used this recently or over the years that it was available, or has it been sort of lying there dormant and nobody really paying attention to it? I think it was it? lying there dormant that people had forgotten about it. I think one person has used it other than myself, and it was 20-something years ago. But we plan on using it frequently and, until they're going to get tired of it. Hello, everybody, and thank you for tuning in to the Liberty Report. Today is a special day because we have a special guest, and he happens to be related to me, Senator Rand Paul. Rand, good to see you. Glad to be here. Well, good, and you've only arrived here into the big, great town of Lake Jackson, returning to your original home. That's right. And uh, you just arrived a few minutes ago, but I'm glad you made it into the studio because we don't get to interview our, uh, our guests too often in the studio. Usually it, it's remote, but uh, this is just great that you uh, were able to make it here. You know, I often think about, uh, you know, the statement, you sort of can uh, cling to this statement, but not totally. People would ask us, uh, people who came from the north, they say, uh, you know, uh, well, you're, you're from the north. And they say, yeah, but the answer was, yes, but I got here as soon as possible. And I think about you, you can almost say that because uh, uh, when I was drafted, I was in Michigan and on our way to Texas, which we, we were in Pittsburgh, our old home, our old home, that's where you were born. So you were about a week or two old when we had to drive to Texas. So you can say, I got to Texas as soon as I could, <laughs> but uh, you decided to settle down uh, in, in Kentucky because it was destined that you would become a senator there. <laughs> but, I don't know if it was destined or not, but, uh, <laughs> but most of my childhood, other than probably two years that we were in Pittsburgh during your residency, I spent in Texas, went to school here, and then when I finished uh, my medical training, uh, you know, I married a girl from Kentucky, and that's how and, I got there. And she had an influence on you a little bit. That's right. Yep. That's Kelly, and uh, and that's uh, wonderful. But uh, today we're going to talk about some very serious stuff. But uh, we always conclude, and I know you're one that concludes with optimism, and. Uh, to me, pointing out the problems uh, is very important, but I was always pleased at the end of talking to a lot of college students that if you had, if you describe the problem and you came up with an answer, recognizing the problem and saying there is an answer gave optimism. So that's what uh, you've been able to do because uh, you've sort of clung to this uh, philosophy that uh, maybe we should follow the Constitution and uh, maybe we should have more individual liberty. So we want to talk about that. And you, you've been very much involved in um, some of the current events. And, and the one that uh, caught my attention just recently uh, had to do with Saudi Arabia arms sales. We did a program on this and it was well received, but we can get a personal update on this because obviously uh, it, it uh, got your attention as well. And not because we talked about it, but it just naturally you, it got your attention, but you're in a place where you could do something about it and you've introduced the resolution. I'd like you to uh, tell our viewers exactly what you did how, and how it would work, and what are the odds of us stopping that sale? Well, we discovered about a year ago, my staff did in researching the legislation from the 1970s. In 1976, there was an Arms Export Control Act, and it gave Congress the right to tell the president, we disagree, we disapprove, and actually to try to stop an arms sale. Interestingly, buried in the bill was the ability of one senator to request a vote, and to get but they didn't divide the time that way. That that makes my argument that uh, you know th there's probably too much bipartisanship right. on the bad stuff. They get together and, and and lo and behold, you know they tend to uh, you know pass budgets and and spend a lot of money and run the welfare state and the foreign policy. Very bipartisan, even though they yeah. pretend they argue. There's a couple things I've pointed out with Saudi Arabia. One, the foolishness of getting involved in the war in Yemen. That there are no good people in right. that war. Who are the good guys, it's very unclear, and maybe the result is, you know, that Al-Qaeda rises up. But the other thing I pointed out about Saudi Arabia is there are still many allegations that they were involved in 9-11. Senator Bob Graham was head of the 9-11 Commission. He's followed this and looked at all the details. He's convinced that the Saudi Arabian government and or <laughs> royal family had something to do with funding 9-11. 
But it's even worse than that, even more recently than that. You know in the emails from uh, Hillary Clinton to John Podesta that were released by WikiLeaks? She says in one of the emails to John Podesta, she says, we need to put pressure on Saudi Arabia and Qatar because they're giving financial and logistical support to ISIS and to radical Sunni groups in the Syrian civil war. She said that. She basically admitted Saudi Arabia is funding ISIS. And so how do we reward them for funding ISIS? We're going to now give them $100 billion worth of weapons. I think it's a, a crazy, rotten thing to do. It is. It's unbelievable. And I think the point, if the American people that you made, that if the American people knew uh, exactly what's going on, and that's been a big job of yours and all of ours, is try to get this information out to people. But you do serve on foreign relations, so you deal with a lot of this uh, information on foreign affairs. But there's another thing on foreign affairs that came up in your committee, and there was a vote, and that has to do with me using it. Because because um, there really is no role for us in the war in Yemen. And I actually fear that what happened in Syria, where we supported one side, Assad was in the other, and then ISIS was here, that in the chaos in that vacuum, ISIS grew maybe as partly because of our involvement. And then the same thing in Yemen. There's really three sides to that war, at least. There's the government that Saudi Arabia supports, there's the Houthi rebels that Iran supports, but then there's Al-Qaeda in the Arab Peninsula, I'm kind of worried that Al-Qaeda actually grows and takes over Yemen after each of the other groups destroy themselves. There weren't that many opportunities in the House to do what you're able to do as a senator. The closest thing that ever came to the, uh, that principle was in 1998, they had an Iraqi Liberation Act, which was always obviously the opposite, because in my interpretation, right. it was a, a, a declaration of war. And they brought it up under suspension. Nobody's going to oppose this. So if both sides opposed it or, or were in favor of it, one person could get all the time in opposition. So it turned out that I ended up with 20 minutes and the rest of the Congress had 20 minutes. But I didn't stop the war, obviously. A few years later, the war came anyway. We've had a couple situations like that in the Senate, and it's still debatable. They say, oh, the Republicans and Democrats split the time equally. And I said, well, no, shouldn't it be for and against? Because sometimes I'm the only <laughs> yeah. one against. And they try to tell me I don't get any time that the Republicans and Democrats split it equally, even though they're both on the same side of the issue. And we've had some battles in the Senate over that. And sometimes they give me the time to be nice. Sometimes they they try to exclude me. That same thing came up when we were doing the resolution in the House on uh, going to war uh, against Iraq, you know, and that, that debate on, went on for about a year. But, uh, and we had a small coalition of some Republicans and, and Democrats.